Hi, I'm Dan Costa, and welcome to Fast Forward, conversations about work, home, and play in our accelerated age. My guest today this week is John Keith, senior editor of Data News for WNYC. Uh, John has a long history of traditional journalism, including time as a police reporter in Wisco at the Wisconsin State Journal. Uh, but these days, he's breaking more news by his programming than his writing. Uh, he's also the author of Family Projects for Smart Objects, tabletop projects that respond to your world. And today, we're going to talk about data journalism. We're going to talk about the Internet of Things. And we're going to talk about how you monitored voter behavior in real time across the state, across the country, right? Across the country, yeah. So well, let's start with the most basic thing. WNYC, public radio station here in New York City, why do they need a data, a data reporter? Uh, yeah, a really good question. Um, the thing about the public radio audience is that they are information consumers, lifelong learners, always wanting to know about uh, the latest thing, not just in politics, but also about the world around. And um, a, a few years ago, we decided that one of the ways we can do that is by making really smart interactives online that are dri driven by data. Um, at the same time, we're in the newsroom, so we help our reporters uh, do investigative stories and other stories uh, when they get spreadsheets and databases and other things. Um, there's a, a sort of a joke in journalism that I went into journalism because I can't do math. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not true anymore. That is anymore. why I went into journalism. <laughs> uh, it happens a lot, but we are sort of the math and data folks uh, including also code and design, uh, plopped right inside the newsroom. And so we help both with the visuals on the site, with the reporter's investigations, and anything else that comes up that might be uh, requires some uh, little skunk works that, yeah. we, that we operate. Because people think of journalism being all about the writing, all about the editing, and then publishing, and then the information's out there. But the packaging and understanding the information is increasingly important. Yeah, and uh, it will often come up with uh, projects that require like a new way to talk to people, uh, whether it's uh, SMS text or other things that just we, we haven't done before. And so we're the crew that sort of jumps in and gives us a shot. So talk to me a little bit about election land. Uh, the election's over, uh, finally, thankfully, right. I guess. Um, what it was election land? What were, what were its goals, and, and did it, you accomplish them? So the goal of election land was to in real time, that's key, uh, keep track of problems at the polls. Um, so the uh, laws around elections um, have changed the voting rights. The Supreme Court changed the Voting Rights Act, um, struck down parts of that. Um, and so this was the first um, presidential election since that change, uh, which led to some more um, voter ID laws and other um, limits and, and other things around voting. So we wanted to see in real time whether or not we could spot any problems at the polls. So in, um, the, in the old days, you'd have reporters at a couple of polling stations, three or four, and they would be there with a camera and they might be able to go live and show what was going on. They get five anecdotal cases across thousands of polling stations. Right, five, and five would be a lot, yeah. actually. And what would happen is you wouldn't hear about it until the end of the day. Mm -hmm. You're like you know, maybe for the evening news, you'd hear about it. But we wanted to know early on, in real time, across the country. So we had 1,100 journalists and journalism students. That's over a thousand. Mm -hmm. um, 125 of them were based here in New York City. We set up this pop-up newsroom at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, and we monitored Twitter and Facebook and Google Trends. And we also had access to data that included um, the folks when you call 1866 uh, our vote, which is a, f a phone number that people use to get help voting or reach lawyers. We had access to that data. Um, and then we invited how people. How did you get access to that? Well, data? we asked them if we could, and we worked out an agreement with them to make sure to protect people's identities mm -hmm. and, and everybody involved. But we wanted to know hey, if there's a problem at this polling place, um, could we find out about it? Um, and then we invited people to join a texting system, actually. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that I helped to run, which was uh, before the election and even during, during, uh, during early voting, we invited people to sign up for this texting service. And what we did is we checked in with you to see if you had voted um, uh, and how long it took you to vote in minutes um, and anything you may have seen, also where you were. Um, and that way, we could add that to this pool of data uh, and we were able to monitor the entire country um, and uh, keep an eye out for voting problems. 
So you did, you set that up. A lot of these are public channels that anybody would have access to. Yeah. Um, SMS is an interesting one because people don't think of that as a channel that can be monitored, but um, that's happening in real time. So what did you discover having done this? Well, a couple of things. Um, we uh, th this was an, a, a collaboration of. Uh, 400 or so journalistic organizations, including ProPublica, WNYC, mm -hmm. The New York Times, um, and then a whole bunch of local papers and public radio stations and TV stations. Um, and then it was also a combination of a lot of tech companies. We actually uh, had help and funding by, from Google, but also Data Miner and uh, a company called Medan and a whole bunch of other tech folks. Everybody came together. Uh, I think there may have been one writ written agreement. This is just people coming together saying, yeah, uh, we'd like to monitor the vote. This is a, a good purpose. So we learned about a massive collaboration, what that takes. Mm -hmm. um, and then we really learned about how to monitor uh, news, breaking news of a sort, mm -hmm. in real time, uh, in public channels and some private ones across the country. Uh, and it took a lot of work and a lot of coordination, but we were able to pull it together. And we saw, we definitely saw problems, but they were the typical problems. Um, broken machines, um, uh, missing poll books, the things you have to sign, you know, they're in the wrong place, so they have to get moved around. There were some reports, uh, before the election, you may remember, there were a lot of, uh, there's a lot of concern and um, even, uh, candidate Trump calling out for people to go monitor the polls. We didn't actually see a lot of that. We didn't see, and we didn't see any intimidation of any, actually we saw some, but nothing organized. Mm -hmm. um, in the end, I think what we learned was the election, the voting process went really, really smoothly with some bumps here and there that you would expect. So one of the other technologies, we talked a little bit about SMS. Um, we've talked in the past about chatbots and how you know, th that's, a, that's an avenue that's just coming into its own that can be used for a lot of this real-time feedback. We've seen a couple of examples so far. Facebook's got a platform. Uh, we know we can order a pizza using a chatbot. But um, ultimately, that's a platform that could be used for a lot more interesting things. Yeah, it's, um, and, and it's early days on this. Uh, the New York Times has done some interesting stuff. Uh, Quartz has been doing some really good stuff with um, chatbots. Um, but a lot of it is um, mostly information coming at you, mm -hmm. right? It's uh, maybe you have some ways to navigate it within Facebook Messenger or in an app, in a chat app. Um, but most of it is still the information coming at you with a little bit of interaction that you get out of it. I think what's going to be interesting is how we can actually, as journalists and makers, um, do, get more input from the audience, um, and also how we integrate into our normal lives. I mean, um, Alexa and Siri and Google Home, all of these intelligent agents are going to be a part of our lives more and more. And so if that's the case, then um, how do we put information and media into those channels that makes sense yeah. um, beyond saying, tell me more, go to the next story, yeah. which is it's useful. It's very but basic and linear. Yeah, very. And, and, and you look at the, the companies that are driving the sort of chatbot development, it seems to be how can we replace humans, call centers, uh, waiting times with chatbots to just answer people's questions. Right. And that's useful and it certainly adds efficiency. But I'm waiting for that wave of chatbots where people are building their own, and it's serving their purposes, and they're really in control. And um, it seems to me we're a little ways away from from that. Yeah, maybe a little ways away, but not that far, I think. And um, to the extent that uh, news organizations also provide useful information, um, even things about like where to vote and and, and other civic information, uh, media organizations, especially uh, local newsrooms, have often been a source for that kind of information. Our team started out uh, sort of helping people navigate the hurricane evacuation map mm -hmm. for Hurricane Irene. Like, is that something you can look at and just view online? Sure. Is there some interactive way? Like, if that were something where you say, you know, intelligent agent, what's my hurricane evacuation zone? And that might be something that a news organization provides at some point. Um, so I think there is a lot to come uh, when, when it comes to chats and bots. So talk a little bit about, you know, one of the things I think is most interesting about your work is that, you know, you say uh, data journalist, and you think about working with spreadsheets, and you certainly do enough of that. But um, you're also out in the physical world measuring things and accounting for things. So it's, it's not an abstract thing you do at your desk. You've got 
you've got robots around the city of New York <laughs> informing on uh, giving you information about what's going on. To give us some examples of that. Yeah, I've been really interested for the last couple of years, just personally, with uh, hardware hacking and computers. Uh, not hacking in the hacker sense, but, but playing, tinkering mainly is what I mean. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and sensing our environment um, and playing with little Arduinos and particles and things that would report back. I've just been having fun playing with those. And then um, a story came up um, that earlier this year where we wanted to work, uh, an organization came, approached us and said that they wanted to measure how hot apartments in Harlem got during the summer. So we live on a heat island in Manhattan, uh, and Harlem is a hot area. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, I mean, literally hot. It's also um, has a, a socioeconomic um, group that is uh, at, sometimes at risk. Mm -hmm. So there are parts of the city where you might have lower income folks or or people who um, don't can't afford air conditioners. Mm -hmm. So what is their life like, temperature wise? So we came up with these um, little, uh, they're little bots. They're um, uh, little Adafruit-based um, Arduino things that would take. That you them. built, you built yourself. Yeah. And gave to them, and <laughs> then they took them home. Yes, we made fifty of them. Uh, mostly, I made them, mm -hmm. um, and uh, we you got get some interns. People put <laughs> exactly lots of soldering. Um, people, we worked with a community group called We Act. And they helped, and they knew people in Harlem. They worked with people to get these devices into their apartments. And they, the devices did two things. It took the humidity and the temperature every 15 minutes and then recorded it to an SD um, card. And then the volunteers would go around and get those SD cards and send the data back to me. Um, and then I would provide that to researchers that were working with, who were working with us. And in the end, we were able to track the temperature in Harlem apartments and a lot of Harlem apartments without air conditioning um, all summer. And we found out that um, it, they are hot and they don't get cool at night, even yeah. when you could get relief from outdoors because of the way the apartments are, the way the buildings hold heat, for so many reasons. These apartments stayed really hot at night, like above 80, sometimes 85 um, at night. And that we uh, did many stories about. Because, um, I mean, and the takeaway being the, the human body is not meant to live on, at those temperatures for those periods of time. Yeah, it, it, absolutely not. And, um, and, and in fact, there are advisories about not spending that much time in that. Mm -hmm. I mean, 85 degrees, if you're, if you're, if you're working in a, an office that's 85 degrees, you are you're sweating it. Yeah, it's about 85 degrees on the set right now. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, so you get the feeling. I get it. But then, then all summer long. Um, living and sleeping in those conditions, we talk to people, uh, you know, who wouldn't leave their homes to go to cooling centers because the hallways were even hotter. Um, and so we did a lot of work, and this was again based on these devices that were just um, running off of batteries and recording the internal heat um, in, in, in the interior heat in these apartments. The thing, uh, the thing that makes that story so interesting is that you created 50 of them. But we're going to, in five years, that kind of sensor technology is going to cost less than a buck. And it's going to be built into phones. It's going to be built into people's homes. And it, it's going to be widespread. And there's going to be this type of data collection, at least theoretically possible, at much larger scale. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing that I think is really interesting when it's not just Harlem, but you're doing an analysis of all of Manhattan, of all of New York State. You can, I mean, it really starts to, to blow up. Can, um, I think that's very interesting. Yeah, and I mean, there are, of course, devices that do this right now, mm -hmm. right? Um, what we wanted to do is a couple of things. One, uh, make them really quickly, exactly the way we wanted them. So we used off-the-shelf parts from Adafruit to put them all together and solder mm -hmm. them together. But then also, um, um, make it available so other people could do it, right? So um, this worked out to be about 50 bucks, but you're right. The, the price for all of this hardware is just coming down. Um, and if we can build them, use them, and then post on GitHub or wherever how we made them, then other people could do the mm -hmm. same project. We're not uh, in the business of cornering the market on you know, uh, things that will measure your temperature <laughs> and right, record it. Right. We, we're more interested in trying it out giving it a shot, and then letting people know how we did it and what worked and what didn't. So we talk a little bit about this data. You're obviously trying to use this data for good, to inform people, to understand our world better. 
Um, I was in Portugal uh, a few months ago, and I was giving talks about smart home and automation and sensors and how your house was going to know when you came home from work every day, and wasn't that going to be great? And every time I gave the talk, the first question was, that's horrible, that's scary. Uh, we should, uh, what about privacy? Does nobody care about it anymore? It seems like people in the U.S. care a little bit less um, than people in Europe about privacy, but like, how do you read it? I mean, you work with this data all the time. How worried should the average consumer be that their entire lives are being tracked now? Yeah, I think that's a great, great question. Um, when it comes to something as simple as the, uh, a, a heat sensor that's using Arduino that's just reg registering the temperature, you, it's hard to see like how you could be worried about privacy there. Mm -hmm. But it could be. There could be an issue. Um, I think this connected data where, yeah, we're being tracked, um, where, I mean, this device right here is mm -hmm. tracking us a lot. Um, yeah. I think... I, Personally, I think it's something people should be thinking about. Um, and uh, thinking about where, what data is being collected, if you can figure it out. And, um, and who's going to hold on to it? Yeah. Um, and then even if somebody's holding on to it, you know, who else could get a hold of it? I, I think about that a lot when we're doing projects, right? Um, we are an organization that, who re respects our audience. And we, if we ask people for information, we try to hold on to that in, in, a, in a secure way. But you never know uh, when that might be compromised or what, what, w if somebody else could end up with that information. Yeah. So we're a little bit careful about the kinds of things that we ask about um, and, and track as an organization, we think about that a lot. I think people who are um, installing that kind of equipment in their homes, I, you know, I think it's, personally, I think it's worth, worth a thought. Do you, are there any steps you take personally in terms of maintaining privacy and protecting your data? Do you use a brow encrypted browser? Or, yeah, yeah. I, I, um, I make sure to uh, use File Vault on my laptops so that if I happen to leave my laptop in a coffee shop, it's basically a, a brick to mm -hmm. anybody who looks at it. So I try to do that. Um, I'm a big fan of Signal, which is the mm -hmm. encrypted end-to-end -end chat. Um, as a journalist, um, there are situations where I may need to talk to people who um, don't, don't want to have it revealed that they're talking to me, and I don't want to have to accidentally reveal that. Um, so that, that's something I use. I do have a um, PGP key so people can reach me that way. Um, online, um, I will just say very few do. Mm -hmm. um, it's PGP. I is have a not had a single thing. person try and reach me via PGP. Yeah, so they, I, I haven't used. I I created a key and I haven't used it probably in ten years. Right. So um, and PGP is hard. It's mm -hmm. complicated. Um, things like Signal are um, a little bit easier. It's basically an app that works like a chat and you can communicate with each other. Um, so yeah, you know, taking some some steps. You know, uh, I think it's. You know, it's it's a challenge to secure everything that you do, and I think um, we do our best. So one of the other things, uh, we want to talk a little bit about Internet of Things. Um, I don't want to talk about your book a little bit. Uh, most people getting into the smart home, making their, their home smart involves going to Best Buy, picking up a Lyris, picking up a Nest, setting it up in home, and or picking up a smart home hub. Your approach is a little bit more hands-on. <laughs> and um, we'll show the book here. It's Family Projects or Smart Objects. I like the way that sounds. Tabletop projects that, re that respond to your world, and I think that's the interesting thing here. Knowing your work is that it's not just stuff you build in the abstract; it's there are objects that actually work with the environment around you. Uh, talk to me a little about the book and, and some of your favorite projects. Yeah, you say it's funny that you say that. Our smart home has uh, got little Arduino things all over that my daughters know how to push the buttons on and stuff, and that's kind of how we start our day on occasion. Um, but yeah, the the book is really about making. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a way into this world of Arduinos and sensors. Um, and I tried to make it as friendly and easy to use as possible. Really walking you through. You do not have to know anything about how to do this to um, to build a lot of projects. Um, the, a, an example of one that I like uh, is just using tinfoil as a um, capacitance sensor. So the the, the the technology that's basically you're you're using, and the 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 idea that you're using when you touch your pad or mm -hmm. the phone is you know sensing the capacitance uh, in your body, and you can 
do a quick little demonstration where you can touch some tinfoil. It's not a button, it's just mm -hmm. you're touching it, or you get really close to it, and you light up an LED. Another example is uh, the somebody moved my stuff alarm, which is that you create a little pressure sensor and tie it to your Arduino, and then you can set your, a toy, or uh, somebody on uh, Twitter put a beer on it, and like if somebody takes it, which, it sets the alarm off. Which is a huge business. I mean, <laughs> Tile, there's a bunch of these places that are, that are using Bluetooth to set yeah. proximity alerts. Yeah. And you can build those at home. And so, you know, the things that you can build here, you could certainly use, and we do uh, use some of these things in our house. Um, mainly the point is to do it, to experiment with it, to play with it, because the prices are coming down on, on all of this hardware. I mean, some of these sensors just cost pennies. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, it, it's, it's, it's not hard to do, not hard to try. And um, I designed it um, to do with kids, mm -hmm. so it's not just a kids thing, it's more like kid parent experience. Um, and uh, that's really the goal, to just understand that, that the technology isn't as mysterious as it seems. Um, there's sure, I mean, we're not gonna be building iPhones or, or fully connected smart homes, but if you can make some parts of it, you understand it a little bit better. Yeah. And, if, and it's fun, and that's the big part. I think that's one of the key takeaways, is that there, people feel this anxiety that things are getting out of control, they don't understand how the world works, uh, they don't understand how you know, the internet works and how all their smart home appliances work. There are smaller pieces of it that you can break away and give you a feeling of control and help you understand how the digital world interfaces with the physical world. And it can be child's play. Yeah. It started really early age. I actually um, do, uh, I teach this uh, at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism sometimes, this uh, notion of making things. And one of the things I like to do is take apart an old iPhone and just show you all the pieces in there. And there are analogs to that. You can buy a little tiny camera. You can buy little tiny microphones. There are other uh, components that are in there. Sure, we're not going to build the iPhone. But yeah, you're right. The sensors that are involved on some level, you can play with pretty easily, and that's what's fun. So you are obviously pretty technologically sophisticated, um, working with all these advanced tools. What advice, in a lot of ways, you're living in the future already. What advice do you have for people who are uneasy about where we're going technologically? Um, what, can they, what can they do to, to uh, take control of this new world? So uh, I Listen to more WNRC. <laughs> Listen to public radio. Um, and I think At least you didn't ask anybody to pledge. Uh, yeah, no. Um, I think getting out and trying your hand at some of this stuff is, um, it's, it's easier than it ever used to be. I mean, um, it, there, came a, there was a time where if you run, wanted to graph or plot on a map um, a bunch of points, right? You needed really expensive software mm -hmm. to like just make a map and put a bunch of points on there. Now you can do it in Google Maps, right? It's super easy and it's free. Um, that, that change, that sort of like, I mean, we're talking, the software was like thousands of dollars and now it's free. Yeah. And now it's not, it's not exactly the same thing, but the concept has come down, right? And in the same way, um, a lot of things online, um, a lot of the hardware stuff is coming down in price in the same way that, hey, it's not actually that expensive to tinker. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if you have an idea and you want to like play with it, you should. Um, that's that's at least, I find that to be both enlightening and just rewarding as a human to just understand this stuff a little bit better. And then you understand your world a little bit better too. And you can ask good questions. You can think through some of the things like security and other things like that. And if you're a journalist, you can also ask better questions of your sources and of the, uh, the people around you. Very good. And uh, your book's a great primer for that. Family Projects for Smart Objects, available on Amazon. Yep. Uh, is that where you want people to buy it, or do you want them to go straight to... Uh, wherever you can find wherever it. Wherever you can find it. <laughs> uh, John, thanks so much. How can people find you online and interface with you directly? Uh, you can uh, tweet at me. I'm at jkeefe. Uh, and my website, my blog, is uh, johnkeefe.net. John, thanks so much for coming on. My pleasure. That's Fast Forward for this week. I'm Dan Costa. Thanks for joining us. Let us know in the comments how we did. I'll see you in the future.